when when this thing starts squawking, mm -hmm. look over here and see if this light, if there's a light right here that's coming up, is mm -hmm. too loud. And just just tell me. Okay. Yeah. And remember, when I tell you, switch to FM. Mm -hmm. That button right there. Yeah. Hey, Bone, you got your ears on? <laughs> heard there at the top was one overdrive editor, namely me, trying to explain to his daughter the mechanics of a little project that will be just a small part of today's edition of Overdrive Radio for Friday, March the 3rd, 2023, where we'll be comparing CB transmissions with two of the new both AM and FM capable radios. Following the company's petition to the Federal Communications Commission to allow use of FM and radios in the U.S., Cobra Electronics introduced its first line of dual-mode radios just this year and sent us two identical 19 mini AM FM models to get a real feel for the principal difference in modes. Sound quality and clarity nearing the edges of range or in situations with plenty of interference. I'm Todd Dills, and for this edition of the podcast, you can know me by the handle Mr. Mike Mustang Crawford once upon a time bestowed upon me. That would be Ghost Rider. W R I T E R. I do hope you've enjoyed your first uh, experience of a CB radio. My capable hand on the other end of the line, well, since her name, like mine, begins with a T. Well, T Bone, I uh, appreciate you helping me out on this little here test. <laughs> I set her up with my audio recorder and one of the 19 mini AM FM units in a vehicle at the house, and then, with my own unit in a different vehicle, ran the same route up to three-eighths to about half a mile out from the starting point at the farthest distance. We're in a Nashville neighborhood here in Tennessee, with plenty of opportunity for interference all around, including for my neighbor, who happens to be a ham operator. He was certainly more help than harm here, though. He solved one problem I had in running the test. I only had a single, very simple, and well-aged magnetic roof mount antenna. When I asked him if he had something we might borrow to get the second device going, he said, well, no, but... Give me an hour. I'll build you one. And so he did. And we were off at the races. Ooh, I still got you there, t -bone. We'll hear more from the Ghost Rider's little run throughout, but also directly from Mark Carnes, Vice President with Cedar Electronics, parent company of the Cobra brand, and who's been with Cobra going way back. Yeah, so I, I have been um, an executive in various roles. You know, I started off with Cobra Electronics before it was merged and we became Cedar Electronics. Um, but in that, the various roles and titles, I've always been into the product marketing aspect of the company. Okay. And today that I'm an executive, I'm a vice president of product marketing and business development. And the business development is sort of a means to an end. Um, if we look at something and we feel that we need um, sort of the development, whether it's market development, business development, we need to work on standards with various associations. My role is to assist in those areas and lead those areas uh, when necessary. And part of that is, um, you know, I'm a member of the vehicle technology division for the Consumer Technology Association. I sit on the Marine Electronics Board. I'm with the SEMA Board. Uh, and I also uh, play different roles with uh, some of the trucking and transportation um, industry councils. Right. And in that, you you get a lot of exposure to the various elements of need from both the carrier side of the coin to the driver side of the coin. When we pick up with Carnes after a break, he emphasizes that a lot of what led the company down the road to petitioning the FCC to add allowance for FM capabilities to the CB radio came from, well, what else but the needs and concerns with the performance of the end user? Perhaps most important among those CB users? Of course, professional truck owners and operators. When you have a diesel emergency, you don't have time to wait around for 911. Instead, call your lifeline. How's Diesel Lifeline? the only emergency rescue product to reliquify gel fuel and de-ice frozen fuel filters without the use of harmful alcohol. 
always safe to use, you can pour it directly into your fuel filters without wasting time mixing it with additional diesel fuel. So this winter, if you find yourself stuck in a bind, skip the tow. Get yourself back on the road fast with Howe's Diesel Lifeline. For more information, visit howesproducts.com. That's H-O-W-E-S, houseproducts.com. Here's Mark Carnes speaking to the long importance of the needs of the end user and his company's long ongoing product development. And for us in Cobra, um, especially when you look at the, the long history in CB radios, um, we, we really look at that as a, not only a tool um, for conducting business, you know, by truckers, but it, it's really the, it could be the means of social media for them. It's, it's how they, how they communicate, you know, during their long, lonely drives cross country. And they've really turned, you know, the CV radio into kind of the first electronic chat room ever yeah. invented. And you have to really respect that, um, aside from the, the information that they get to conduct their, their business, that this is something that really keeps them uh, keeps them alert, keeps them informed, and just keeps that level of um, social isolation at a minimum. The dynamic Carnes is describing is no big secret for listeners here, of course. Around the time of the rise of so-called social media 10 to 15 years ago, many of the owner-operators I knew took to calling the CB and the communication and more enabled by it the, quote, original social media, in fact. Track back through some of our older Overdrive Radio episodes and you'll find one all about that notion and the history of owner-operator Mike Mustang Crawford within it. The same Mustang I mentioned up top, of course. I'll post a link to that episode in the show notes. If you go searching for it, otherwise, the title's having a little fun with Mustang's former CB handles. Quote, how the lucky turkey became the maverick became the Mustang, of course. The upshot is that the humble CB played a huge role in trucking culture and its evolution through the years. And you have to kind of take that pretty seriously. Uh, so when you look at something that is a, an age old technology like CB radios, and I'm talking to people, they're always asking, gosh, I didn't even know CB radios were still made. And, <laughs> and I go, yeah, it's like uh, next time as you're driving down the interstate highway, look up at that truck you're passing. And if you see some antennas, that's his CB radio. And that's how they talk truck to truck. And they're like, oh, I didn't know that. Right. So. You know, to, to get to the background of why FM, um, yeah. you know, CB uh, rests on AM and an AM and in the 25 megahertz band that CB operates in, you know, it was really put together in the, the, the early, the late fifties and early sixties. And Cobra has made an effort over a number of years to try to deal with situations to help improve it. But this you know comes from a we're going to go from 19 channels to 40 well why did we need to do that well the traffic increased so much across the use cases that you know the people were stepping all over each other um there's various technologies that you can deal with am and why do you put them into play because people have a tough time understanding each other and you know there are uh, various ways that people go about trying to improve its range but the biggest issue that they fight with is not the range it's so much it's the quality of sound how can i actually hear what's going on and you'll you know you can be on there and listen at given times going down the road and it yeah, it's pretty hard to understand some people accents aside um, and when we looked at the number one issue that we thought we needed to tackle was how do we bring higher fidelity uh, into the use of a CB radio. And we all know, you know, back in the days when it was AM radio for entertainment and FM came into play, what transformed in terms of the quality of the music experience. And we know that we, we had to solicit to the FCC before they made really any hard decisions on spectrum that we're not asking the, C the FCC for more spectrum. What we're asking the FCC to do is allow us to change modulation so that we have the capability when range isn't the only thing you need and you want sound quality that the user of this can go to that experience. And we 
you know, work with the FCC to explain how this isn't going to interfere with other use cases, ham radio operators, a number of things. But in general, what we were appealing to is the fact that we could use the ban that has been associated with it for decades, and we can improve the experience. And by doing so, it will help drivers communicate to each other. And the FCC does look at this and say, uh, above all, we're here to make sure that the people who use this can use it properly and use it to their advantage. So while it took a little bit of technical convincing and the fact that uh, we wanted them to adopt a dual mode approach so that nobody is isolated, no matter what the transition experience will be, uh, and laid all that out and how we would accomplish that, you know, really gave the FCC the confidence that they could implement something like this, and it would be a benefit uh, to the radio user, and it wouldn't isolate or obsolete somebody's approach to using their CB radio. Um, I just want to make sure I'm, I'm hearing you. You're right there. In terms of that dual mode approach, so what you're saying is the FCC... <laughs> FCC changed was the ability to have AM and FM capability in in a single unit, but not not to just produce FM only CB radios is the idea. Yes, we did not want them to just say it's all. Oh, we're going to go to right. FM now. We're like, right. whoa, 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 whoa. We got millions of people out there who yeah. have AM CBs, and they may choose to use it. It may be the better method when they're out on an open desert road of being able to communicate to each other because they need the additional distance. What we wanted to do was say, look, um, we want dual mode uh, right. so that when we start off with this and we enter into it with, let's say one of our most popular units like the, the, um, the 29 LTD, uh, we can put dual mode and somebody can buy this. And when there is a good install base of FM users, they're gonna start to really enjoy being able to travel down the same interstate highways that they're used to. And then now they can hear every word the individual that they're trying to reach is saying. And um, if their buddy still has an AM radio and he wants to talk and he hasn't made a change yet or hasn't decided that it's time to move over, he can still communicate on the AM band yeah. to that user as well. Yeah. So the, the dual mode you know, really helps the whole transition period. And CB users are not prone to changing their products very quickly. Uh, right. Typically they're gonna do so when it breaks uh, or there's a reason to make a change. And right. that could happen in a normal sequence of five years, let's say. And we do make, you know, considerations that our, our products are built so heavy duty to last that long but we are implementing a technological benefit that will be immediately available to those people who own that product. And when there are enough of those people out there who own those products, it will become kind of the commonplace use. It might be difficult to find an FM user out there right now, right? Right, today, mm -hmm. yes. Uh, yeah. At the end of the year, you know, you'll start to, to be able to go, oh, uh, he's on FM. And by this time next year, and, and I think within the, the 24 to 36 month, you know, traditional um, adoption cycle, you'll go from very, very little on the road to there'll be high concentrations of it till it'll be pervasive. If Carnes is right and the AM FM dual mode units get more and more common, you can learn to recognize when an operator is on FM and you're on AM. Here's what it sounds like to receive an FM CB transmission on a CV communicating in AM, courtesy of the Ghost Rider and T-Bone, as it were. We were but a few car lengths away from each other at that point, you guys you should know. And then, when the receiver switched over to FM and both uh, both CBs were in FM mode, this is what it sounded like. Got your ears on. So how's that, how's that sound? Is that uh, noticeably different? We, we wanted to make an investment in not that FM is at the high end of the spectrum, but dual mode is going to be implemented in every one of our most popular sellers first. So if you go to Matt's and you look at the display in our booth, you see the entire classic series in front of you with dual mode. And that, that means we're going to commit to the highest volume runners and the highest level of replacement because it has the longest install base first. 
so that we can help facilitate the transition in the most expeditious way. It's not to say we're gonna, not going to have some cool stuff that comes in there. And, and if you happen to be at Matt's, I'd like to have you come by our booth. I'll show you something really exciting. For now, um, the commitment really is that our 29 Classic Series has its best movers, you know, with the dual mode already implemented right now. Carnes elaborated a little bit on just what that exciting product news at Matt's would be. But yes, just a little. Yes, we were committed to making sure that our uh, most popular runners at the lowest parts of our price point were going to be immediately available to make the transition. But we also um, took the opportunity to make sure some state-of-the-art product, when it, when it arrives, is really encompassing everything that we envision it to be. And cool. we're going to see that with another one of our partners that will answer the second most asked question, uh, which uh, I'll be happy to demonstrate to you when you come by the booth. Any uh, chance I can get you to tell me what that second most asked question is? Well, <laughs> I'm still on embargo, so they, okay, okay. <laughs> they would shoot me if I did that. That hasn't been a whole a lot of time since uh, Cobra's had this line of, of dual mode uh cbs available but i know there is there have been some other manufacturers that have had had them out since i think last year uh maybe, maybe even a little bit earlier um you can correct me if i'm wrong on that um but are you seeing a lot of truckers take these up is this one thing i was curious about the, the adoption right now is really small now it was president that kind of co-signed on to the petition with FCC. Right. You know, they're a European-based uh, company. Um, right. FM has been in use in Europe for some time, so it was oh. to their advantage uh, to have it switch over to FM so they don't have to make entirely different products for different regions. But they're they're pretty small in the marketplace. So not to brag, but, you know, we have uh, a considerable section of the market, you know, and you'll, you can't go to a local truck stop retailer without seeing, you know, four or five units on display to be sold right there and installed, you know, while you wait on your rest period. Some of the other smaller brands aren't that fortunate. So the, the advantage here um, will be that availability at the point where the truck driver can make his decision and when he's on rest period, that's what's going to make the difference with the acceleration of the adoption rate. And our partners, our retail partners are um, queuing up right now so that as we all go into the springtime, you will see um, dual mode systems available from everybody. What is the range difference on, uh, you know, on any given unit um, between you know, just the AM and FM modes on the same channel, you know, same antenna, everything else. Is that, is that something that's quantifiable? Is it, is it significant? Well, it's, it's a great question. So technically the transceiver the, is the final part of this is the same. So the four Watts applied to AM, four Watts applied to FM. Think of it in, in aspect of it's the quality of the quantity. Um, I can hear really, really good till I can't. And with AM, sometimes even when the person is just a half mile away, you can barely hear over the static and things that are out there. And you're tweaking and you're squelch and all your noise blankers and you pick him in. FM, it, it's kind of like an automatic thing. I, it sounds great. And then it fades away. I, I don't have yeah. it. What's the difference in range? Uh, I, I'm going to tell you that you'll you'll not notice a range difference in high population areas. What you're most likely to notice is that when you're in a um, an area like a, an open desert or an open plains area where you can you don't have the background electronic noise going on, you can make out that AM signal a little bit longer than you could FM because FM will not tolerate the noise in the background it just says it's not a signal i can make good you won't get it there's no differences in antennas because the the final amplifier section is the same it's the same yep. you know frequencies um it's really going to be the fact that you're 
FM transmission is less pervious to noise. So um, if there's another broadcast antenna, like your buddy, if he's a ham operator, um, he's queued up with a fair amount of wattage, he can overload an AM front end really quickly and it's, an, it's garbled. Um, where the FM is not going to be susceptible, as susceptible to that situation. Okay. And yeah, sure. th these are the things that you'll notice. It's like if you, you're in Nashville, you know the neon signs and all the other things that are on Broadway. Um, they have a particular frequency that they hum at that AM devices don't like. Yeah. If you are transmitting and receiving both on FM in that same area, you're like, oh, no problem. When T-Bone and the Ghost Rider tested the modes, we heard some of this a bit, particularly at the farthest points, when the traditional AM communication got particularly static as such. What? You still got me? Yeah, there's a little bit more static in the background now, but I can still hear you. Right, that's what happens when you get the distance between you. So now I'm at, I'm actually, I'm actually going to cut this short and go down Frank. And I'm going to head back, and when I get back, we're going to switch over to FM and try the same route and see how that sounds. And now from that same distance in place, with both units in FM mode. I'm going down 14th, and I'm getting pretty close to the stop sign in Franklin. How it sounded? I can still definitely hear your voice well. I think there's like less, it's less muffled than it was last time. Turn on Franklin now, headed down Franklin. And um, this is uh, on the FM as, as opposed to the AM. I'm, I'm headed down Franklin and getting ready to turn. I'm back on the 16th, come back towards That's the kind of the, the experience that you'll receive. It will be like breathing new life into an old radio. Here's a big thanks to Mark Carnes for his time. You can find much more about the new AM, FM, dual mode CBs that Cobra's got out now via Cobra.com. My colleague Tom Quimby also recently updated a 2021 story with detail on the variety of manufacturers now offering AM FM units, including Cobra, of course. Find a link to that story in a post that houses this podcast for Friday, March 3rd, 2023 at overdriveonline.com slash overdrive hyphen radio. I'll drop it in the show notes too for the podcast wherever you're listening, where you can also give us a rating or review if you're enjoying these episodes, Apple and Google Podcasts. Spotify, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and so many others. For any feedback for me, dial 615-852-8530 and leave a message there on our podcast line. Overdrive Radio is a production of Overdrive, the voice of the American trucker. It's edited and produced by me, Todd Dills, with the acoustic guitar and other support of trucker songwriter and Overdrive contributor Long Haul Paul Marhofer. The theme is Legend of the Snake Man by Marhofer. Featuring the guitar work of Travis the Snake Man himself, Lamick, Terry Two Socks Richardson on bass, keys by Tishomingo Jim Whitehead, and on drums, Andrew Marshall. The podcast is backed up further by Overdrive's own news editor, Matt Cole, social media coordinator, Holly Young, executive editor, Alex Lockie, and video editors, Lawson Rudisil and Andrew Gwynn.